All right, good morning. So, great start of the morning, actually. Two very inspiring talks. And uh, I hope I can keep up with the level of quality, actually. Uh, I'm Dan, and I live and work in Amsterdam. Uh, everyone knows that city for the wrong reasons. Uh, we have about, I don't know, 800 years worth of cultural history. And so that's Golden Age, VOC, painters like Rembrandt, uh, Van Gogh. But every time a tourist asks me for directions on the street, it's something like, hey, man, do you know the, the shortest way to, uh, to a coffee shop? So um, as an engineer, I saw a little problem there. So I started a little guerrilla uh, warfare. And uh, every time someone asks me that, I give them directions to the closest museum. Um, get some education, punk. <laughs> so uh, th first of all, I want to I wanna speak my heart here. Uh, yesterday was really great, in my opinion. There were some really inspiring talks. But I had a lot of trouble uh, focusing because, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> Do you guys see that little string right there moving in the wind? It's driving me insane. And, and as soon as you see that one, <laughs> you see the other one as well. And you just can't unsee that anymore. So. Uh, Adam, is there something we can do about that? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, that's, that's too bad. Well, um, you know, just try to ignore this stuff. Uh, thankfully, uh, my presentation is in a 60 to, uh, 16 to 9 ratio, so you won't be bothered by that in my presentation, but um, just try to keep that in mind, all right? Uh, so, the Backbone Tango. Um, is it flickering? Ah, not for me. Oh, wait, that's the remote, maybe. Just tell me if it's flickering again, I'll uh, disable the remote. But um, back Montango. So uh, I work on a web application called MapKit. And uh, just let me jump straight in. What's MapKit? I'm, I'm going to show it to you. This is MapKit. It's a geographical information system which basically means it's a program that uses a map to present data to its users. And in the case of MapKit, it's used by public utilities to manage the maintenance on their water networks and sewer systems. Uh, so it allows them to quickly see what the problems are in, the, in their water network and which parts need repair and, and which parts um, uh, are in need of an emergency response, for example. And in addition to that, uh, we do some advanced network calculations to show bottlenecks in the water network and, and, and try to predict future problems. And, well, you can just click everything in this, um, in this application. You can click on, a, for example, a round thing is a hydrant. Let me, let me open up the legend here. Uh, so you have the blue lines, which are water pipes. Uh, the round things are fire hydrants, and, and the uh, rectangular uh, or the triangular things are, are uh, valves. And you can click on any of them to get some additional data. And um, for example, a, a mechanic can go to this particular fire hydrant, which is blue right now, and he, he can just add another report and say, all right, there was, there was something wrong. Uh, excuse me, that's Dutch. I, uh, I wasn't able to translate everything into English on such short notice. But you can, you can just say, well, this is solved. You, you press save, and it turns, <coughs> it turns green. So you can just move around select everything and um, well considering the bottlenecks I was talking about say for example you click on this valve right here if I zoom out again you can see an entire part of the network just turned black what I just did was I selected a part of the water pipes and I said all right I, I want to close this part off so the red part I want to I want to drain that from water I want to work on that and MapKit is going to tell you well are you sure? Because you're just going to put 1,600 families without water right now. Is that really what you want to do, or is there maybe another way we can, we can do this? Uh, so they can use MapKit for that kind of thing. Um, now, the most important thing for us, we use Backbone for pretty much everything in, uh, in, in MapKit. So we use it for routing, for rendering, for, uh, for, well, everything, and especially for data, because we have a lot of data. 
we have millions and millions and millions of these valves and, and, and fire hydrants because we manage the water network for pretty much the entire country now. So we needed some ways to improve performance. We can't just load everything in at once. <clears throat> and on top of that, uh, MapKit is mostly used by users which are out in the field. Those are mechanics uh, with a laptop bolted inside their van uh, with a mobile internet connection and they just drive around and, well, the connection is spotty at best. So we needed to squeeze every little bit out of performance optimizations to get it to work snappy. So what I did for this talk, I selected four topics that I want to talk to you about today. And they're all regarding optimization of, of, of communication. So the first three are going to be about that, about how can we make it faster. And the last one, the Q, is about improving uh, reliability. So I'm going to start with indexing. This is a bit of a, prelim a preliminary uh, topic. I'm going to explain a bit how we load in data, how we, how we get that stuff, and uh, how that paves the way for lazy loading to minimize the amount of data we actually have to load in, and for grouping requests uh, together. And I am going to conclude with the queue, which is designed to uh, minimize data loss and improve uh, reliability of sending data out. So let's start with indexing. Uh, like I said, uh, MapKit uh, has to manage a lot of data, and everything is displayed in a map like you see here. Uh, these are the fire hydrants, but if you keep that in mind, it's, it's actually just a table, right? It's just plain tabular data, and if you want to lazy load a table, you well, it's pretty straightforward on the backend side, not on the front end, but on the backend side, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, you have, for example, let's say this is a table, and... This is batch one. The user scrolls down and you load batch two, right? You can order these batches of data in, in, the, in the order in which they appear. Now, for a map, that's a different story because the user can move in any direction he wants. So you cannot number these batches by the number in which they, by the order in which they appear. So we need to come up with a different solution for that. How do we number these batches of data? Now, let me show you. So this is MapKit again with only the uh, fire hydrant. And, well, you might have guessed from, from, the, um, from the scheme I showed, but we uh, divided the entire world up into a grid. And you can just zoom around. Let me zoom around on that. You see, you can just see everything is in a tile. And immediately, you can see every hydrant has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with one of these tiles. And since every tile has a unique X and Y coordinate, you can calculate a unique ID for that specific tile. So you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a tile and a hydrant, and you have the unique number for that uh, tile. So when you move around, you just see the IDs coming in, and you can just ask uh, to the server, give me all the data for that tile ID. And it's pre-computed, so it's, it's kind of an index, really. And uh, that's how we did that. So that paved the way for a few optimizations we did. And the first one is lazy loading. This one is really important for us um, because it's a lot of data. And, well, obviously, we need some way to lazy load and, and uh, grow our collections. We start with nothing, and as soon as the user moves the map, we, we, we slowly grow that collection. Now let me show you how that looks. Here we have the same uh, tile index. All the tiles are green, and when you move the map around, MapKit knows which tiles are new, and also knows which ones it already has in cache, and, and it doesn't have to load those. So if I just move the map a little bit, you know, these ones are green. MapKit knows, all right, I don't have to do anything. And the same goes when you zoom in, right? You, you don't get any new data in. And when you zoom out, you will have to load 56 new tiles. So how did we implement that? Well, the most important thing, actually, is we just added uh, another fetch method. So normally you do a fetch, and we do a fetch tiles, actually. We, but before I get to that, I need to explain a little bit of how the map works. So the map uh, consists of three parts. It's just a uh, usual MVC structure. So the map itself is leaflet, open source. 
uh, that's the view layer, you have your controller, and you have your map collections. So a hydrant collection, a valve collection, a pipe collection. These are just globally available singletons. And everything starts when the user moves the map. So it triggers a move ant event. That in turn triggers the process map move method. And the map controller is just going to go by every uh, map collection to ask, hey, I, I have some new tiles in view. Do you want to fetch them? And it's entirely the, um, uh, the responsibility of the map collection to get that data, uh, cache it, and then send it off for rendering. So what we could do is just, you know, we have our tiles, we have our data, send it off for rendering, call the display models uh, method. But we decided not to do that. Uh, instead, every time the user moves a map, we create a little fetch controller. That is just a little object with three methods. And we pass that along as a second argument to the fetch tiles method. Now, why did we do that? Well, uh, the most important reason is you can have multiple maps inside the application. So you have the main map you already saw, but there are several smaller maps which are their own instance of the map together with their own instance of the map controller. So if you would like to have a constant connection between the controller and the collection, you would have to have several permanent connections. So well, that's really cumbersome. Um, so we also could have just passed the map controller as an argument. And we, si we decided not to do that because this solution provides clarity of intention. It's very obvious what is the purpose of this. The, the map controller is saying, fetch me some tiles. I want these IDs. This is the list of IDs I want. And these are your options for interacting with me. So whenever a map collection is interested in fetching tiles, it'll say, OK, I want to I fetch. When he's done, he calls fetch ready. And when he wants to display something, he calls display models, which get relayed to, uh, to the map eventually. OK, so like I said, the most important part about this is the fetch tiles method. So I want to talk a bit more about that. Um, I'm going to focus on the hydrant collection just as an example. And first, let's, let's look at some code, because every map collection for us is a subclass of mapkit.collection, which in itself is a subclass as well of backbone.collection. Now, the most important thing we do is we create a tile index object, which is just a cache. And then we listen to the add and remove events. And whenever a model's added, we uh, try to index that. So we read the tile ID I showed you previously. And then we try to add that to the tile index object. Now, this is simplified code. I mean, there's some stuff happening in between, but this is the most relevant part. And you have a remove index entry method as well. I can I assume you can guess what that does. Um, and like I said, the hydrant collection is just an, a globally available singleton, which is a, a subclass or an instantiation of, of the mapkit.collection. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to fetch tiles. And like I said, you get a list of tile IDs and your fetch controller. And the first thing it's going to do is indicate that it wants to fetch, right? It wants to get those models. It's going to call prefetch next. And it's going to look in that tile index to see which tiles are already loaded. Now, if it finds some of those tiles, it's going to send them off for rendering. And it's going to return a new list of tile IDs and these are the ones that are not available yet. So these are going to get sent off to, do, to, uh, to the server. Now, if that list is empty, we're done. But if it's not, we're doing a request to the server. And when we get a response, we, we send that stuff up for, for rendering, and we're done. Now, if you look at that in code, it is another method added to mapkit.collection. Fetch tiles. You get a list. You get the controller. We indicate that we want to fetch. Normally, this would be under certain conditions, but I just, you know, simplified again. And then we do a prefetch, which expects the new list of tile IDs which are not available yet. So it starts with an empty list. It loops through the tile IDs it got, and it tries to get the models from the cache. If they are available, it sends them up for rendering. If they're not, that tile ID is added to the list, and we return the list. If it's empty, we're done. And if it's not empty, we're going to request those tile IDs. Now, when that's successful and we get the models back, we try to add them to the location, uh, to the collection. And 
uh, this part relates to what I showed you previously. We listen to the ad event. So these models get automatically indexed. So the next time we want those tiles, they're going to come from uh, the cache. And then we do a display models of fetch ready, and in case of an error, uh, just a fetch ready, because there's nothing to display. And uh, that is a bit how that works. Now, the most important thing is, of course, what's it gaining? And let me show you that in another demo. Is that readable at all? The all right, it's pretty legible. <laughs> so what I did for this demo is I pre-recorded a set of movements I made, and I'm going to replay that recording a few times with settings enabled and disabled. So first, I'm going to disable the lazy loading collections, and I am going to move around. So right now, it's really stupid. MapKit is really stupid. It doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know which tiles it has. So it's going to keep requesting the same tiles over and over again. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty slow right now. And it is loading a lot of data. Because if you look here, you can see 529 kilobytes for just a few movements. Now let's uh, type that in. And right now, we are going to enable the collections, lazy loading, clear the network log, and do that again. Now this time, it's going to cache the tiles. And you can see when it's zooming in, it's already faster right now because those tiles are already loaded and we're done. And this time, we only loaded 150 kilobytes, which means just by enabling the lazy loading, we have a reduction of 72%. Uh, uh, but we can do better than this because we can also apply lazy loading to models, which is actually pretty simple. Uh, so let's take, for example, the uh, defaults of a hydrant, right? So every time the user moves the map, we only load a subset of the actual data that we need. So all the hydrants you can see in the map, it's only this part. We only need um, a location, which is the point, and we need a status to, to draw the little, the little uh, shape. Now, whenever the user clicks on the hydrant, that's when the additional data gets loaded. But how can you tell whether a hydrant is fully loaded or only partially loaded? Um, well, in the case of a hydrant, you could just check for, for an address, for example. Um, but other data types might not have an address. Um, even more so, some hydrants don't have an address. So you would have to add specific code for every different data type to check whether it's completely loaded or just partially loaded. Now, instead, we just add another attribute, which is sparse. And it's true by default, which indicates that this model is just only partially loaded. Now, because it's true, we're going to fetch the additional data from the server. And the server is going to respond with the additional data together with sparse set to false. Now, the next time we need the additional data, we can see, all right, it's already false. We already have it. We don't need to download it again. Um, now, if we add that to the same demo, we go back, and this time we, ena oh, wait. we enable it, we clear the network log, and we do the same movement. And this time it's even quicker because it only has to load, the, the queries are actually simpler right now, and we load uh, 102 kilobytes. And that gives us a total of, let's say 102, so that's a total of 81% reduction. We only have to load 19% of the actual data we should normally load, and that um, speeds things up. So that is lazy loading. Uh, I talked about lazy collections. We uh, steadily and slowly grow the collections when the user moves the map. We use a tile index cache property and a custom fetch tiles method that just checks the property if which parts are already loaded. And on top of that, we apply uh, lazy loading to the models. And for that, we use a sparse attribute to just check whether that object is fully loaded or not. Now, this presents another problem because uh, it's 
actually perfectly fine if, if a user clicks on a hydrant or a valve and you have to load the additional data. Uh, but in some cases, MapKit is going to need the additional data for several items at once. Uh, for example, when clicking on water pipes. Now, before I am going to show you that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about these water pipes. So, consider this. Uh, this is a, a part of the water network, right? These are water pipes. Water is running through them. And um, there's a problem. So, we need to work on this pipe. We need to repair it, and for that, we need to drain it. It needs to be dry, because otherwise uh, it would be a very uncomfortable job. So it would be perfect if there was a valve on either, on either side of that problem, so we could just close the valves, drain the pipe, and just get to work. Problem with this is you get an insane amount of valves in your network. This would be a complete nightmare to maintain. So instead, they introduced the concept of sections. And now if you want to drain that pipe, you have to drain the entire section. And you can use MapKit to, to show you what is that section, which assets do I need for that. And so MapKit can highlight that stuff for you. And you can probably already see um, we are going to need the additional data for several items at once. Now, if you look at that in a demo, uh, I am going to disable grouping. And I'm going to select one of these water pipes. Oh, let me clear the network log. So I'm going to click on one of these. Nice. Why was that? That's always a tricky part, right, of live demos. All right, let me, let me do that again. Grouping off, clear the network log, and select that sec. Oh, I certainly do, yeah. Well, normally this is because, I, yeah, right, see? That is the great benefit of client dictated high security automatic logout functionality for you lovely uh, sorry about that oh really <laughs> all right I am probably able to fix that by doing that there you go just pretend like nothing happened and we are going to select that section. So, all right. So now you see nine requests, right? Let me zoom in on that. You see, uh, we need the extra information on that section. Um, we need uh, some more information on valve, section valve, section valve. Well, you, you see the pattern. Uh, it needs additional data on about nine different things. Now, if you enable grouping, clear the network log, and select the same section, it will group those things together, right? Resulting in only three requests. Now, this is mainly important, like I said, because our application is used on spotty 3G connections and you get huge round trip times, uh, which can really add to the waiting time eventually. Uh, so I, I just did that. Um, so how did we do this grouping thing? Um, well, for that, we added another method to our collection, which is called fetch model. And we had to make a decision. Uh, whenever we add or whenever we get additional data, we can only use collection.fetch model. We don't use model.fetch. We don't use collection.fetch. We can only use this method. And the most important thing is just a simple timeout. We delay the actual request by 50 milliseconds, and every other request that comes in just get appended to a pending list. Now, from the top, uh, we need a model, so we get the model if it exists, and we create it with no attributes if it doesn't. And then we're going to check if it's already pending. We use the CID for that. And if it's already pending, well, we can just wait until the, um, the delay resolves, and we get that stuff. Uh, if it's not pending, we make it pending. So we, we have two attributes for that. And, well, we set, the time, we set the timeout, we set the delay, and we return the model. So at this point, you can return an empty model. So on the other end, you probably need something like a promise or a deferred or whatever. That's not the focus of this talk right now, so I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, but if the delay times out, we splice the models out of the list, so we get all the models that are currently needing to be fetched, and we generate a query string based on those models. And let's say you have four valves that you want. it would generate a query string like this. 
So every time you do a fetch models, it's going to do a fetch models with a unique URL. We don't have a fetch all models for this collection URL. We only have a, a, a fetch models with specific IDs URL. And eventually we do just a fetch with that query string and we empty uh, the pending list. And that's about it. Now let me show you what that means in terms of time needed to do uh, the selections. So I disabled grouping again, and I'm going to do another one of these recordings. And next to that, I'm going to enable uh, the 3G emulation, right? Very nice new feature of Chrome. Oh, excuse me. Clear the log, and I'm going to make a few selections now with grouping disabled. All right, so there you go. Um, as you can see here, that's about 120 requests we had to make, and it took us 3.6 seconds to do that. Now, if we redo that same thing, but this time with grouping enabled, remember, 120 requests, and we do it again. And this time, we only needed 60 requests, or 62 rather, and it only took us, well, only, it took us 2.9 seconds, so we shaved about um, a little less than a second off. Now, this sounds, maybe it sounds like not very much, but uh, 100 millisecond round trip time, as you can see on top here, is actually pretty optimistic. Uh, what we see is more things like 200 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds. At a certain point, this is going to uh, add up for us. Uh, so, that is grouping. And now I get to my final topic, which is the queue. And this is an important one for us because these mechanics that are driving around in the fields with their spotty internet connections, they actually provide very important data for us. That data that they add to MapKit is, is essential for uh, the calculations that we perform. So it's, uh, it's unacceptable if that data doesn't arrive. Uh, so what we wanted was some sort of request queue that would keep track of all the requests that are happening, and as soon as they fail, it should hold on to them and retry them until they succeed. So we had a few requirements. Uh, the first one, obviously, retry failed requests until it succeeds. And very important as well, it should survive page requests. So we don't want to bother the mechanic with stuff like, hey man, uh, your, your request failed. Uh, could you please wait? He couldn't give a fuck, really. He just wants to get on with his work. <laughs> you know, he just thinks, all right, this is just a stupid computer. Uh, I mean, these guys just slam around with these laptops. Uh, they don't care. So uh, if it fails, it should retry that later on. Uh, because for us, it's not really important uh, that the data arrives at that specific moment. It's perfectly fine if it arrives three days later. It just has to arrive. That's the most important thing. So if it, if it fails on Friday and it succeeds on Monday, that's just perfectly fine. And finally, it should be invisible to Backbone because we didn't want to alter the behavior of the actual Backbone library. Um, now, we searched around for this, but we couldn't find any open source uh, software that did this, so we um, developed it ourselves. And let me show you how it looks. Now, this is a bit of a... Um, fabricated demo because like I said it's invisible so I had to come up with something uh, on the left side you see a few buttons and these are just uh, fake re well they are actual requests I'm going to do perform actual requests to the server but this one you know it succeeds immediately uh, this one is going to fail on the first try and it's going to succeed on the next try and so on so this one as you can see it's going to retry in two seconds now for the next one it's going to retry in three seconds, and after that it's going to succeed. Now I can just add, you know, whatever. I can just do this. I can just refresh my browser. Doesn't matter. It's just going to refresh it again. It's just fine. It just keeps track of everything. Refresh that again. And sooner or later it's going to send them all out. So, and we'll wait for the last one. Yeah, all right. So how did we do that? Well, for that, we obviously we had to um, override the sync method because that's where uh, the actual communications uh, happen. 
and we only needed to replace the backbone.ajax call in that method, and we replace it with a q.add method. And the first thing that does is it creates a request object. So normally you would create like an XHR or something like that, but we create a request object, which is just a simple plain JavaScript object. First thing is a, is a GUID, globally unique identifier. Um, so this makes every request unique. This, is get, this, this gets sent along uh, to the server. So the server also knows which is which. Um, so with this ID, you could, for example, implement some backend code that prevents replays and stuff like that. Uh, the next three things are just what Backbone creates, parents, options, and a model. Um, and then we have a status. Does, did it fail? Are we working on this? Is it doing nothing? And we store the last and the next timestamps. When was it retried last? And when should we retry it next? And then we record how many times it's been tried and how many times we should retry it. So there's um, two scenarios. You can get data. Uh, and you can send data, obviously. Uh, we're not very interested in the get part, so we just go straight to execute. I mean, that can fail. Uh, the user probably retries that. So we're just going to focus on, on sending data. And the first thing it does is not a run. It's going to store that request. And for that, it's going to store that in two places. We're going to store that in the browser memory as well as in the local storage. Uh, and with that, we can survive page requests, right? So we need to synchronize those two. So whatever's in browser memory needs to be in local storage. Not so much the other way around, because there can be multiple tabs open. So there can be more in local storage than what is in memory, right? So we added a layer of abstraction to that to take care of all that synchronization and stuff. And the first one we already used. So uh, right now, the, the, the request is in memory. And now we can call a run, which starts a simple loop. So we're going to loop through all the requests there are. We're going to get the additional information. And we're going to try and execute that uh, request. Now, if it's already busy, status busy, we can just ignore that stuff. If it's not, we set it to busy, and we go to the next one after sending it off for uh, to the server, obviously. Uh, now, as soon as the server responds, it can either be successful, in which case it gets removed, or it can be an error, in which case we retry the run loop with a little delay. Uh, and that's the next timestamp. So um, if we tried it two times, we do the current timestamp plus uh, three seconds, for example, and we rerun the loop with a delay. So what this means is, uh, it is actually not always running. It's only, the, the loop is only running when there's actual requests being made. And, well, that is how the queue works, really. And for this, I am uh, not going to show you any code because uh, we open source this. So you can look at it yourself. Uh, it's called uh, Cucumber. It's available on GitHub. And there's a few caveats you, um, you should remember. It's still a work in progress. I mean, we're still working on this. We're trying to find the best way, actually, to, uh, to do this. Um, there is some documentations. Uh, documentation, there is not a lot of tests. So if you have some tomatoes left from, from Henrik, you can throw them now. Um, but other than that, it, it works pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well, actually. And um, we're very welcoming to uh, critique or, or IDs or bug fixes or anything. Just um, have a look. But the most important thing is it requires some backend code because uh, you know things are going to get shuffled. Failed requests might arrive later than other requests. Everything is going to be turned around, so you can just you cannot trust uh, the data anymore. You have to uh, perform some some backend synchronization probably. And with that, I conclude my topics. So we talked about indexing, a little bit of intro. Laser loading to uh, optimize what we, what we send and receive. The same thing goes for grouping and a queue for improving reliability. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you.